everybody. Um, today I'm going to tell you a story. On a cold winter night at our Seattle Bing offices, our top data scientist was working late. He was going through our search logs when he stumbled upon something strange. He noticed that searches for a local school district, the Washington Lake School District, had a huge spike in the data. So more than the average number of users were searching for that query on that day. In fact, it was one of the top 10 most trending queries on Bing. So he started to wonder why. Now, the first thing that occurred to his mind was that there might be some breaking news event relating to the school. Because most of the time, if there's a breaking news event, a lot of people will search for it to understand what happened and to get updates about the event, which causes spikes in the search for that event. But that wasn't the case. You know, he did some research, and there was no news event associated with the school happening on that day or even a week leading up to that day. So he started to wonder what could cause the spike. So what he did next was he looked back in our search log and he tried to find other instances where the same thing has happened, where spikes for a school search has happened and there was no news event justifying it. And he found a lot of instances. Now, the observation he made was basically that all of these instances occurred in winter. Now, that's not a coincidence. So what he decided to do was to join the weather data with the search data to understand whether there was any correlation. When he did that, he came to the realization that the day after the spikes occurred in the searches, there was almost always there was a snowstorm happening. So what, what was happening? What caused the spike in the data? What was happening is that the, news, what the weather forecast said that there's going to be a snowstorm on day X. So the day before, users and people started searching more and more for their school to navigate to their website and to understand whether there was a school closure or delay so they know whether to send their kids to school. So what's fascinating about this? What's fascinating is that if you were in a closed room, you had no access to your phone, you had no access to your weather app, you had no access to the weather forecast whatsoever, just by that observing that one data point, just by looking and seeing that the number of people searching for your local school district is higher than average, is higher than usual, then you know whether you should grab a jacket to work the next day. Isn't that fascinating? Just one data point can tell us whether the next day there's going to be a snowstorm or not. So we started to think, you know, if one data point can tell us that, if one data point can tell us whether the next day there's going to be a snowstorm, imagine what the terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data that we have access to can tell us. And so this is how the idea of Bing Predicts was born. Now, you and I, on a daily basis, we generate a tremendous amount of data. I mean, take a look at some of these numbers. We have an average number of 18 billion queries that are done on search engines every month. We also have 6 billion hours of video that are watched on YouTube every month. We have 500 million tweets that go out every day, and people spend, on average, around 640 billion minutes on Facebook. Now, that's a ginormous amount of data. But the thing is about data is that in its raw format, it's very unstructured and unorganized and does not carry a lot of valuable information. I mean, if you go back to my example, if I observe that there's a spike in searches for a local school district, that means nothing to me. If I join that with the weather data, and boom, I have a data signal that can tell me whether the next day there's going to be a snowstorm or not. Now, that's amazing, right? So, as a data scientist, this is my job. My job is to take that data, which is unstructured and unorganized, get aggregate information out of it, and that get it to that knowledge tier, where I understand what the data means, I understand its value, and I use it to help solve real-world problems. And as a data scientist, I'm lucky to be working for a search engine, because a search engine has access to the web. It crawls and indexes the web in order to satisfy the user's information need, and so it has access to almost all of that data. It has access to terabytes of data, which is just sitting there waiting to be processed, understood, and modeled the right way. So having said this, we started to think, you know, what can we predict? What can we do using this data that we have access to? So the first event we started looking at is American Idol. So American Idol is like Chinese Idol. It's basically a singing contest in the US in which contestants perform and then at the end of the week, there's one or more contestants eliminated based on users' votes. So we started thinking, you know, can our data be used to predict who's going to be eliminated off the show? So we started looking at data such as, if I'm a fan of Caleb Johnson, who's a contestant on the show, I'm going to watch his YouTube videos, I'm going to download his music, I'm going to listen to his songs, I'm going to visit his homepage, and if I'm given the chance to vote for him 
versus another guy, I'm likely to vote for Caleb Johnson. And so we took those features, we modeled it through our machine learning algorithms, and we came out with a model that predicts who's going to be eliminated each week from American Idol. We ran it for the entirety of the show, and by the end of the show, we had achieved over 90% accuracy in predicting who's going to be eliminated before the results were announced. But that's not even the most fascinating fact. The most fascinating fact is that when there was five contestants remaining on American Idol, including Caleb Johnson, our models were favoring Caleb Johnson so strongly that no matter how we modeled the numbers differently, no matter how we projected, how we looked at the model in a different way, the models were preferring Caleb Johnson so strongly that he was going to win the show. So we came out with a prediction that Caleb Johnson was going to win the show, and he ended up winning. Now, isn't that fascinating? No matter what Caleb Johnson did on the show, no matter how he sang, no matter what he did, no matter how he performed, five weeks, when there was five contestants remaining on the show, we knew that he was going to win the show. And the other fascinating fact is, is that all other experts out there, including Vegas Odds, where you bet money for who is going to win the show, were favoring Jenna, were saying that Caleb Johnson is going to lose. So our models could predict with higher accuracy than other experts out there who's going to be eliminated off American Idol. So when the show ended, we started thinking, what else can we predict? You know, if we can predict American Idol, can we predict other events? So at that time, the World Cup was about to premiere in June of 2014. So we started to think, can our data be used to predict the World Cup? Can we predict who's going to win the next match between, say, Brazil and Mexico? Now, the thing is about the World Cup is it's a little bit different than American Idol, in a sense that, ultimately, it's a, people's, it's a player's performance on the field that decides whether Brazil and Mexico is going to win. It's not really people's activity and searches and social data on the web. So the hypothesis we wanted to test here, though, is can Bing's data, can Bing's search and social data be used to improve statistical models, which are currently used to predict the outcomes of the World Cup? And the answer was yes. Now, I know that may seem against intuition. You know, why would my search results um, and why would my search history contribute to me predicting who's going to win Brazil and Mexico? But take this example. Now, I'm a big fan of Brazil. So when Neymar was injured during the World Cup, and he's a, for me, he's the best player on the Brazil team, if someone would have asked me, do you think Brazil is going to win the next match? I would have said no. Now, that's just one data point, and it may be insignificant, right? How is my opinion contributing to the match? But if we were to find a group of people, if we were to find a group of people who are Brazil fans, now these are people that follow every match of Brazil. They follow the players, they follow the statistics, they, they know which player has a red card, a yellow card. They know every single thing there is to know about Brazil. And if that group of people, if the majority of that group of people don't believe in their team, don't think that their team is going to win the next match, that's a very important signal to go into the models. You know, it's, more, it's actually equally, if not more important, than the history between the two teams and who won, whether it's a home game or an away game. So when we took those web and social models and put them on top of statistical models, we were able to improve statistical models, accurately predicting 15 out of the 16 World Cup knockout matches. Isn't that amazing? We had over 94% accuracy in predicting who's going to win the World Cup. So the World Cup ended and we had huge success. You know, we could predict the World Cup and we could predict American Idol. But as data scientists, we're always hungry for more. You know, we want to see, okay, what else can the data do? It can predict sports, it can predict entertainment, but what else can it do? So at that time, the Scotland referendum was about to take place. The Scotland referendum is the vote to determine whether Scotland was going to gain its independence from England. So we started to wonder, could our data be used to predict the outcome of the election better than polls? Now, polls are currently the way that is used to predict the outcome of an election, where people just basically pre-vote, right? They pre-fill a survey that in which they vote whether Scotland's going to be independent or not. So we wanted to test and see whether our data could be used to predict the outcome of the election better than the polls. So we put the data features through our machine learning models, we ran it, we produced three weeks ahead of the election, we produced a model that can predict the outcome of the election. And so what it came out with is it was saying that Scotland was not going to gain its independence, it was a no, the outcome of the election was a no, but that it was a very close race, it was a 52% to a 48% race. Now, at that time, polls were saying the same thing. Polls were saying that the outcome of the election is going to be no. But polls were saying that it is not a close race at all. It is 70% in favor of no. Come the day of the election, when the results are actually announced, what do you know? It's a close race. It's a 47% to a 53% in favor of no. So what does that tell us? 
you know, we don't really need polls. At the end of the day, Bing's data makes polls obsolete because people have already told us who they're going to vote for. We don't need to ask them again. We even have data that's more accurate than polls if modeled the right way. So we've shown that our data works for sports, and, and that's important because we get users closer to the match. They, under they understand their team's strengths, they understand their team's weaknesses, they understand what does my losing team need to do in order to win the match. We've shown that it works in the field of entertainment. We've getting users closer to their shows, closer to their contestants. They can understand that if my contestant is going to be eliminated, I need to go vote for him. We've also shown that our prediction data can make polls obsolete. We don't need polls anymore. We already know what users want and how users are going to go. All we need to do is just look at the data the right way and model it the right way. But we started to think, you know, we used our data and we predicted the future, but we want to take it a step further. Now, we can predict the future, but can we use our data to improve the future? So we took the problem of adverse drug reactions. Now, adverse drug reactions for rare diseases is a very hard problem to solve. To give you an overview of the problem, so sometimes if you take two medications, their compounds can interact, causing negative side effects. That's why, for example, your doctor tells you not to consume alcohol while, while taking a certain medication, or while your nurse always asks you for the list of medications you're already taking before prescribing the next one. They want to make sure that the medication they give you does not have any interactions with the medications you're already taking. Now, why is this a hard problem to solve? Well, suppose that a pharmaceutical company comes up with a new drug for diabetes. Now, suppose we have a group of people who are diabetic, but who also have a rare heart disease for which they're taking certain medication. If these people were to take these two medications and have a negative side effect due to that, pharmaceutical companies have no way of knowing this because they simply have no access to that data. It's a very group, small group of people that they have no access to. Whereas at Bing, even though that group is very small, we have access to that data. Now, we don't care who the user is. All of our data is anonymized. We don't want to look at individual users' data. What we want to do is we want to find that group of people who have that heart condition, are taking medication for the heart condition, who have recently started taking this new drug for diabetes, and have started having these common symptoms that are a cause of the drugs interacting with each other. And we can know all of that from the searches that these people are doing on Bing to find out you know, what was happening with them, how can they cure it, to read if other people had the same issues. So if we were to take that data and model it, what we come up with is we come up with a model that can help with the early detection of adverse drug reactions. So if we were able to flag these issues early enough, what we can do is then we can send that information to pharmaceutical companies who can act on it much sooner. What that helps us do is it helps us improve health and even further helps us improve lives. Can you imagine that? The data we have at Bing, when you look at it, when you look at searches, it means nothing. But when you model it the right way, it could actually be used to save lives. So, <laughs> so the, the idea that I want you to take out of this today is that data is the future. Data can help predict the future, and it can also help improve the future. It can help improve my life and your life. The only thing that we have to do is we have to take that data from its raw, unstructured, and unorganized format, and we have to get it to that golden tier. We have to get it to that knowledge tier, where we understand what the data means. We find those unobservable patterns out of it, and we use it to help solve real-world problems, help use it to solve my issues and your issues. Thank you very much.